Suda51 is like the king of niche video games. His stuff never wins awards or gets high praises from critics, but there's something about them that some people just can't get enough of. The style, the attitude, the surrealness. When you play a Suda game, even if it's not particularly stellar, you at least know you're gonna get something different. Probably the most beloved series from Suda is No More Heroes, a hack and slash about a dweeb otaku assassin. It's full of references to wrestling, over the top anime moments, and an aggressive Tarantino esque attitude. Fuckhead! Oh, I, uh. I guess this video is gonna have swearing in it. Frick! Yeah, I never really fancied myself that big a Suda fan. I mean, like, I like the No More Heroes games and. I really like Killer7, but outside of those two, I never really found myself that interested in checking out his other works. But believe me, I've met Suda fans. The people that care about his stuff really care about his stuff. His games may not be for everyone, but they certainly do have their audience. These are people that are really freaking passionate about the stuff this guy makes. So imagine the reaction when they announce a new No More Heroes game. Not only is it a new project from a man that means a lot to some people, but it's a new entry in his most popular and most loved series. There was a bit of confusion about what kind of game this was even gonna be though. Talk of it not being a third entry, but instead this weird spin-off game started to come up, but expectations went through the roof when they debuted that first cinematic trailer. You wanna play? Let's play. It had the visual style, the action, the attitude that the series was known for. They even made a deal out of this one actually being fully directed by Suda51 himself. It seemed like whatever this was gonna be, it was something at least fully in tune with what No More Heroes is. But then we started to see actual gameplay of it and, well, I must admit I did feel really underwhelmed by it, but I decided to remain cautiously optimistic either way. But that was then, and this is now. Here it is, Travis Strikes Again, a side game in the No More Heroes series exclusive to Nintendo Switch. I think it's pretty evident by now that it's not really the game a lot of people were hoping for. I mean, upon release, it immediately bombed with critics. But does that really mean much? I mean, Suda's games never do well with critics, not so much because they're not good games, but sometimes because they're just a little too experimental for the average player to really be on board with. Take Killer7, for example. I think that game is a freaking masterpiece, but when it came out, it averaged a 7.5. So, with that said, I decided to pick up Travis Strikes Again so I could see exactly how the game turned out myself. Is it really that bad, or is it simply a misunderstood experiment that just didn't really sit well with people? Either way, I'm gonna give it a solid chance. Let's find out. Of course, the game opens up with that cinematic that they used for the Unveil trailer. A bad man, the father of bad girl, who Travis killed in the first game, is tracking Travis down so he can exact his revenge. And once they start fighting, oh man, it's the visuals and style and the one-liners that we all know and love from the series. They even got Robin Atkin Downs back to voice Travis. There's a new generation of gamers out there. Let me at least introduce myself. People really didn't react well to the change in voice actor when they first showed that trailer, so they actually went out of their way to get him back to redub all of the lines for the game's final release. That's a really respectable effort. Kind of feel bad for the other dude they got, though. Bastard! They're trying to better up the gamers! In the midst of their fight, Batman notices that Travis has the Death Drive Mark II, the Phantom Game Console. Legend has it if you can beat all six fabled games, you will be granted a wish. So of course, Batman wants to help Travis beat these games so he can wish his daughter back to life. Though that's not really communicated that well, like what we actually see is the two getting sucked into the game and then immediately just cooperating? Like we come out of the game and there's no dialogue between the two to kind of reaffirm either party's goals or interests or anything like that. Batman's just sitting there chugging back a couple of beers and swinging his bat and he's, yeah, he's not trying to kill me for some reason. I don't know, I find it kind of hard to just suspend my disbelief like that the second the gameplay starts. I think maybe a line of dialogue or two could have gone a long way. 
But yeah, that's pretty much the gist of the plot. The uh, two of you will fight your way through each different game, and while each game is different visually, the gameplay remains exactly the same. It's always a top-down hack and slash where you'll cut through waves of enemies until you make your way to the end of the level. And yeah, that does sound like a No More Heroes game, but it's very different in execution. All of the mechanics of the previous titles are pretty much gone in favor of a much simpler control setup. Holding down Y does a rapid light attack, X does a heavy attack, A dodges, and B jumps. That's new, never really jumped much in No More Heroes, except those parts in the second game where you played as Shinobu, but yeah, jumping was never much part of the series, so that's kinda different. There will be some segments of brief, simple platforming, and the jump is also good for getting behind swarms of enemies if they're all in your way. There's also four special attacks you can map to the face buttons. Uh, holding down L and tapping a button will execute the corresponding attack. This could be something like a grab move or a shock move, uh, stun moves, uh, the healing move. That was one I found really helpful, especially for moments between fights when I found myself lower on health. You unlock more and more of these moves as you progress through the game, and you can swap them in and out as you please. You'll probably experiment with a bunch of them until you find four that you really like. There's not really much variety to the enemies. They're all kind of like these uh, little skull looking dudes, and there are different types of them, but not many of them differ enough to really feel like you're fighting something truly different. It feels more like versions of the same enemy that just sometimes have slightly different attacks or have a different weapon. The game's extremely repetitive. You'll walk a little bit and the game will stop you in place until you've defeated everything on screen, and then you go and then you do that again. And yeah, like the original No More Heroes games were like that as well, but there's just not enough here to really make doing this nearly as fun as in the original two games. A really big part of it for me is the camera. It's no longer down behind Travis over the shoulder where you can see the action up close and personal, but now it's pulled way far back looking down on the action up from above. And I have to admit, I really freaking hate it when games do this. I felt the exact same way about Super Mario 3D World's camera. Like look at this, I just chopped this dude's head off. It's right there in front of me up close and personal. I can see it, I can feel it. Feels good taking out these guys, each and every one. It's repetitive, but it's visually exciting. And it doesn't really get old that fast because of it. But here I may as well be stepping on ants. There's a degree of intimacy with what's going on that just does not exist when you're this far away from the action. This right here I think is a really good point. You can unlock tons of different t-shirts to wear, and they represent dozens of different indie games. So you can sport one of your favorites as you hack through enemies, but the thing is, if the camera camera is pulled back so far away that you can't even tell what shirt he's wearing, then what's even the point? And insultingly enough, there are times when the camera will come down and closes in on the fight, and it feels good to actually be able to get a good look at what I'm hacking away at. But this like never happens, you're gonna be staring at some pretty teeny tiny characters for the grand majority of the game. And well, the game, it's not terrible, it's kind of fun, I guess, but it does get old quickly. These levels go on way too long sometimes, too. The first one took me over an hour to complete, and I was bored of it long before then. I think the game would have benefited from shorter, uh, quicker bursts of levels. Maybe like 20 minutes each, I guess? I mean, you can only be doing the exact same thing for so long before getting tired of it, right? The game will try to mix things up sometimes with weird gameplay gimmicks, uh, like this map where you rotate these tiles by hitting a switch, or this uh, bike mini game that looks really cool, but isn't much fun to play. It tries to have variety, but there's not enough to it. And when it does have variety, it's usually not particularly interesting. The environments can look really nice, though. Some of these areas just look gorgeous. It's 80s neon at its absolute finest. There is still that iconic No More Heroes style here, not just in the visuals, but in the writing and how willing it is to get weird and experiment. I mean, between every level, you do a text adventure game, and I think this is actually a pretty nice nice way of breaking up the action. Reading about Travis's encounters as he tracks down the next Death Drive game, it's actually pretty entertaining. This is probably the part of the game that I imagine the diehard Suda fans might even love most. Every single game opens up with this bizarre cutscene that is reminiscent of a different era of video games. The first one you get this pixel art, which is, yeah, whatever, a little bit overdone, but this second game, it's got this weird live action FMV sequence, like a, a Sega CD game or a 3DO game or something. It's so good. Let's play a game of death. 
And the third game has these like PS2 or Dreamcast looking graphics. They always introduce the level's boss in such a cool freaking way. Not to mention the interactions between Travis and the boss of each game. Uh, the first game is one that Travis grew up loving and the boss was his childhood hero. And here he is talking about how he has to kill the guy that he looked up to as a kid, even if it's just a video game character. Travis Strikes Again will have those weirdly poetic moments that the series is known for. And there's plenty of references to Suda's other games that I'm sure the diehard fans are gonna really appreciate. Like one of the entire levels is just a giant homage to Shadows of the Damned. And one of the opening cutscenes has Dan Smith from Killer7. Uh, don't worry, that's not a spoiler or anything. They tweeted the hell out of this. It was added in an update, and yeah, it had the Killer7 fan in me crapping my pants. And I freaking love how the Death Drive games all come with these little magazine articles, uh, kind of like a Nintendo Power Preview telling you all about it. There are some seriously cool things here. But on the other hand, you'll have to sit through hours and hours of extremely mediocre gameplay to get to these things. That's kind of ironic, isn't it? A video game themed after video games, yet you go into them and they're just not as fun as Travis seems to remember. You could probably spin this as some sort of artistic statement, and knowing Suda, I really wouldn't put it past him, but who am I kidding? This game isn't really all that fun, and it's not likely that was on purpose. I figured I could at least see if the game was any better on multiplayer, so I got Brady over to play it with me, and yeah, it is a lot more fun on two-player. I mean, everything is, but I think the game lends itself to multiplayer a lot better than single-player. It's not hard to tell that this game was made with two people in mind. Like the way you can balance the enemy's aggro between the two of you, and you'll have a variety of special attacks between the two because you have to share from the same pool. Besides, the camera's pulled out for this exact reason, so you might as well take advantage of it. And I figured I may as well ask Brady what he thought of it since he has the perspective of somebody that's only played it on two player instead of the perspective of me who played the whole thing single player and thought it was really boring. It's very simple, I guess. It's just hack and slash, play it with a buddy. I don't think I would put that much time into it if I were to play it one player. It wouldn't be my main choice, my first choice to pick as a game to play, but uh. If I had really nothing else to do, I would probably just play it. As for the single player, I was really burnt out by the end of it. The final level especially. It is so tedious and visually uninteresting. And it goes on way too freaking long. And they try to shoehorn in some like Hotline Miami stuff that's just not as cool as it sounds. I don't know. The ending had some really cool stuff though after the credits, I guess. And that is... A reason worth finishing it, at least. It sucks, man, because there is a lot to love here. It's got so much that the hardcore Suda fans are going to love, but whether or not I can recommend it to you really depends on how willing you are to play something that isn't really all that fun. And I'm sure people are gonna reply to this video with that stupid fucking Reggie quote, uh, if it's not fun, why bother? Well, because video games can offer things other than just fun. Like, I don't remember Killer7 so fondly because it was fun. I remember it because it was different and strange and experimental and really freaking interesting, man. Like, that game certainly wasn't for everybody. But it sure as hell was for me. Like, imagine how boring the world of video game development would be if nobody experimented. But everybody just tried to make things that were cut and clear fun and nothing else. I guess my point is, the game is not for nobody. There are gonna be people that will be okay with sitting through something that is pretty mediocre if it means they can spend some time with a character they love, visuals they find interesting, and writing they enjoy. But that's gonna be a very, very small percentage of the people watching. Like I said, Suda51 is the king of niche video games, and sometimes that's not always a good thing. If you're one of those hardcore Suda fans who don't really mind playing through something that's not terribly great if it means you get what you want, then yeah, sure, I'd recommend it. But if you're literally anybody else, or somebody who simply likes No More Heroes 1 and 2 and just wants more of that, I wouldn't bother with it. This game's appeal isn't non-existent, but it is gonna be very limited.